Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we are on with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. Welcome, Dr. Lamb. Hi. It was like, it's been a while because we have yes. been in January. Huh? <laughs> so, and uh, I, so just to, just to um, point out, we do not have Arroyo with us today, but we have, who's in the background? Maureen there? with us today. Maureen. Yep. How old is Maureen? I, I forget. Maureen is 33. Wow. Yep. Does she, is she, uh, is that considered, would you consider her geriatric? Like, would she, you know, just like when we had our geriatric talk a few months ago, it's, there's a little bit of subjectivity to that number, right? Um, there's certain things about her that seem sort of geriatric, but not, not totally. Like, I feel like she's, she's not totally in there in that category just yet. <laughs> okay. She's, but she, so she's, she's active. That's good. Like she's, yeah. She's active. I mean, of all my birds, she is probably the most chill, but she's always been like that. So it doesn't see, I mean, well, the full time that I've had her, I got her when she was 16 years old. So she hasn't been with me her full life. So and she's always been just kind of relaxed. So, but I got her because she has seizures um, and her previous owner couldn't continue to take care of her um, because of it. So, um, you know, who knows how much that plays a role in her being a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Wow. That is, that is, she's lucky. I mean, out of all the people that take you in, I bet. I mean, who knows? Yeah. All yeah, about it took, her health. It took a while to figure out how to get them under control. Um, but she is at a point where she is real stable with them and, and is on, she's on three time a day medication, um, but she does well. So, oh, okay. Oh, good. I'm glad she's with us today. Um, yeah. Let's see. I'll give people a couple. Uh, it's like another minute to 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 log in and join us to get our our, our uh, audience here. Um, I was just noticing someone from California, and I am also from Southern California. I feel your pain because we've had rain, and we cannot handle rain here in California very well. But one of the fun things, though, is we have the um, you know like the feral parrots, the Amazons, and and oh my gosh, I was watching them like just in the just get drenched, and they like. They love the rain. And so seeing all the birds, especially like the, 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 the parrots we have flying around here, like just in the rain is, is so enjoyable. Uh, yeah. So it, it kind of, and I think it is, I've heard owners say, bird owners say that when it rains outside, sometimes it, uh, it makes their birds like jump in their bath, like their, their water, like it kind of, is that, See that sometimes too it depends you know i think on probably how frequently it rains and everything the sound of the rain like, whoosh, maybe like yeah that. well you know and i'm sure you probably heard about the whole uh birds will jump into their baths when people vacuum their yes. House, yes you know so i don't know if it's like the sound of the vacuum somehow also simulates that sound of rain i don't i don't know what that link is that makes that happen but it's a thing <laughs> So that would be a good way to get your bird to bathe. Just vacuum around. <laughs> vacuum. You know. Back on again. So you're doing two things. You're you're cleaning up after the bird who's definitely making a mess and they're taking a bath. It's great. There you go. <laughs> well, well, let's see. I'm going you know to, I'm going to, I have to vacuum. So maybe I'll, I'll try that with my budgie, my budgie friend here. Um, all right. <laughs> um, so on that note, I'm going to let, uh, oh my gosh, by the way, I didn't say what today's topic was. Um, it's our new series um, and it's going to be species spotlight and I cannot, stress how fun it is to start with this bird species, Patagonian Conyers. I mean, wow, those are like the birds, that whenever I've, I've had the rare opportunity to see one, um, out, uh, it's like a wow bird. It's like, wait, is that an Amazon? No, it's, no, no, because it's so big. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, they're a little different looking. It takes you a moment to figure out what group are they in? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm gonna let you take it away, uh, Dr. Lamb, and I okay. can't wait to see this. Yeah. All right. Then I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. All right. So yes, uh, our new fun sort of series um, is a species spotlight. So we're going to talk about this particular species. Um, and uh, the first one is the, the Patagonian conure. Um, and the reason we're choosing this particular species to talk about is because, um, so I, I wasn't here for the month of December to do a webinar, uh, like I usually do my once monthly ones. And the reason was because because I was out on vacation and um, me and my husband had 
decided to go to Chile and kind of see different parts of the country. And when we made that decision to go to Chile, I said, well, if I'm if I'm going down there, I would love to go on a bird tour. And I would really love to see the Patagonian conure because I know that they're down there. And I just, I really enjoy seeing birds out in the wild. Um, you know, not only the typical birds that people think about like as you know birding like your little songbirds and raptors and you know waterfowl all that stuff I, I really really enjoy getting to see uh parrots in the wild because you know here in in the states um where i work you know i'm working with parrots uh every day and it's really enjoyable to get to work with them and i'm really lucky that i get to work with them and so when i go on vacation uh i also like to look at them in, in other ways and um see where they're from and maybe get to know them a little bit more because I'm seeing them in a totally different context, you know, the wild where, where they're meant to be uh, free flying around and, and uh, there for us to enjoy um, in a different way. So uh, this is me down in uh, Chile searching for the Patagonian conure. My husband was taking this photo of me as I was out there really looking for them through my binoculars. Um, so before we go on my adventure, I thought it might be fun to talk a little bit more specifically about who the Patagonian conure is. So because I, you know, I'm a scientist, I have my undergraduate degree in biology, um, I wanted to show you phylogenetic trees of how birds are related, because this is the sort of stuff that you talk about in, in biology classes, because when you're learning about how animals and different species, whether it's you know, a species of bacteria or a plant, you know, we like to figure out how everybody is related and how things have evolved and branched off and gained their individual unique characteristics. And so these trees, these phylogenetic trees here kind of help us out. So this one that's over off to the left hand side, this phylogenetic tree outlines all the different species of birds. So um, all the different species are connected, uh, all the different avian species are connected from like one common ancestor, essentially. And so when you look at these things at the very base of the phylogenetic tree, this is how down at this A over here, this is how everybody's related to each other. And then you can see how different species have branched off into different groups. So like where our first branch, you know, you have the uh, Paleonathae groups, which is going to incorporate things like the ostriches, um, cassowaries, rheas, you know, some of these bigger birds. And then this whole other group of birds over here that's going to include, you know, uh, like our chickens and our ducks, um, and then our little passerines and raptors and pigeons and all sorts of different species. And at the very, very sort of top here of this particular outline of a phylogenetic tree, you can see how many different branches have happened to get to this more specific grouping, where we have birds uh, in the U. falconiform morphe uh, group that actually encompass the falcons. So falcons are somewhat closely related to the little um, citizens and the passerines. Uh, so they're all sort of in this group here. So it's kind of interesting because if you look at the, these phylogenetic trees, the falcons are actually more closely related to parrots than they are to others, the cipiters, um, which are like red tail hawks and Harris hawks and those sort of guys. So it's just, it's really interesting because, you know, when you look at a falcon, it looks really similar to red tail hawk or some other hawk, you know, um, but they're actually more closely related to parrots, which is super cool. And the way that we figure these things out is initially, you know, people were just kind of lumping and splitting things based on characteristics. What do things look like? And if you go even far back in history, there was a point where bats actually were grouped with birds, which is really funny because they're, they're mammals, right? We know that now, but back then, you know, people didn't. And hey, it had wings, it flies. So like, a bat is a bird. But with time, you know, and we start to understand species more, we start to recognize that things sometimes look similar, but may not actually be related. And that's kind of the case here with the falcons. They look similar to other hawks, but they're actually closer to parrots. Um, so, but then amongst our, our parrots, you know, we have um, even the little like finches are in uh, closely related to parrots. So we have the falconiforms, the cetaciforms, which are parrots, and then the passeriforms. Now, 
If you go over to this phylogenetic tree over here, there's over 300 species of parrots that fit into that cetaciform group. So this tree over here actually shows the many different, uh, 69 different genera of parrots. And so those 69 different genera of those, there's even then the specific species and there's over 300 species. Um, so this just shows how all those different species of parrots are actually related. And with the Patagonian conure, highlighted this little area over here, because if we look through all this different data, the, this is the Patagonian conure down here. So if we look at, if we go back and look at how it's related and how it's like branched off from other types of parrots, this is where it's branched off in the phylogenetic tree to be uh, distinct and different from other species of parrots. And here's this big group of all these other parrots. So just blowing it up over here. Again, this is the Patagonian conure. This is its genus species name. We have the uh, name, you know, the common name that we call it, the Patagonian conure, um, but it's also known as the burrowing con conure. But the true scientific name is a genus and a species. And so this, uh, Cyanolysis patagonis is the actual genus species. And then it's related to all of these other types of birds. So who are all these other types of birds that our Patagonia conure is uh, closely related to? Well, groups like the uh, Arctinga. So this is like our little, our little sun conure here um, is in the Arctinga genus. Uh, the Ara genus, so like our uh, typical macaws. Um, the Orthocetasa genus, which I didn't, uh, I don't think I've ever seen actually one of these personally. It's the, this is a red belly macaw, so a different group of macaws. Um, then the Cyanocida genus, which is the Spix macaws. The Nandaeus genus, which has little Nande conures. Um, the Diocetasa, which is going to be like the noble and the Hans macaw. The, uh, this genus is a little hard for me to say. It's the Guaruba genus, um, and it's a golden conure. And then uh, the Leptocetasa, which is the golden plumed parakeet. I've never seen one of those before. But so all these different types of um, macaws and, you know, smaller, like the Aratinga, which is kind of like mini macaw or, or small macaw, um, you know, all these groups of birds are closely related to the Patagonian conure. So just kind of neat information to know how they're related and um, who their cousins actually are. So where is the Patagonia conure from? Um, well, this picture here is a picture of South America. Um, I did get this particular picture from, from Wikipedia. You can see my reference over in the corner. Um, what it's showing is these are the different sort of territories where the Patagonian conures live. So um, this very thin little strip of a country that goes all the way down to the tip of South America. That is um, Chile. So that's where that's the country where I went to visit in December. Um, and then we have over here, we have Argentina um, and a couple of other South American countries. Um, and this particular map is supposed to be a current map, depending upon like what reference you're looking at, you may see slight variations in the ranges that are are present. And you know, on, on the one side, sometimes I'm like, oh man, that's annoying. This book has it wrong or this reference have it, has it wrong. Why, why can't these references get together and say like where these species actually are living? But then when you really think about it, you kind of sit back and go, well, birds aren't always static. They're not staying in the same spot all the time. They're going to different places. So things change, you know, they may be regionally in one particular area for a while, and then suddenly there's an eruption in an other area where they're present more than they used to be, and maybe they're less present in some other area, sometimes associated with human activities, sometimes associated with weather changes or habitat changes. Um, it, there's variabilities in why uh, things can change. So this is a map of where they could be, but things could potentially change a little bit and you might see uh, little bits of different references. So 
But if you look a little bit closer um, on the map here, again, this is a little thin strip of country on the west coast of South, of South America um, is Chile. And this little area that I have highlighted, um, that is uh, Maui. And I apologize if I'm saying that slightly wrong, but that's where we went to actually see the, the Patagonian conure. So it's kind of like right in the middle of the, the country there, you know? And if you, if you look, um, you know, uh, we're probably again right about over here, which is you know pretty far, pretty far south. I think sometimes uh, I know I will often uh, think about a lot of our parrots being these more tropical species and kind of being more like you know um, living much more northern in, in South America or really southern in North America um, and sticking more along the equator um, and being in this band. And the reality is, is they're adaptive animals and they they travel um, and disperse a lot further than sometimes my mind wants to think that they go to and put them in this little box. So I thought it was interesting because to me, I'm like, wow, that's a lot more south than what I was expecting for this particular species to be going to. And if you look at the map, I mean, look at Argentina, they're even further south. It's amazing. Um, so, but that is, that is the uh, portion of the country where I was um, when I was able to go searching for, for the Patagonian conure. Okay, um, a couple of facts about the, the Patagonian conure as well. Um, currently, there's about four subspecies. Sometimes you'll read three subspecies. Um, as I was mentioning earlier with the phylogenetic tree that I was showing and how we like lump species together and split them apart, scientists love to constantly change taxonomic things um, because we find out new information. You know, as I was saying originally, when we're figuring out how species are related, we often initially base it off of external characteristics or maybe behavioral things. Um, but as we have become more advanced with our scientific knowledge, we are starting to do more genetic studies. And as we do more of these genetic studies, we're starting to understand more how, you know, there are the variabilities of a species. And so um, right now we're saying there's four subspecies. I don't know how that could potentially change in the future. Maybe with more genetic studies, we might end up saying, hey, there's only two subspecies, or there's six subspecies, I don't know, or hey, maybe four subspecies is correct. Uh, you know, it's, uh, this is the information that I have right now, but this absolutely could change in time. So as of now, the four subspecies, again, um, the, the genus species name is Cyano, Cyanolysius patagonis, and again, you know, scientific names are sometimes a little hard to say, so I apologize if I'm saying that Cyanolysius wrong, but I think that's how it's supposed to say. Uh, but there's Cyanolysius patagonis, patagonis, so the subspecies is that third name. There's, I'm just going to say C, patagonis uh, conlara is the next subspecies, C patagonis andeus, and C patagonis Block Sammy. And so the particular species that, or subspecies that I was seeing is considered the C. Patagonis Block Sammy, also known as the Greater Patagonian Conure. Um, the other groups are kind of just called the lesser Patagonian conure, and it's because there is a size difference. So, um, the lesser Patagonian conure, generally the weight size is going to be between like 230 to 340 grams, which is still kind of a big range in my mind. Uh, but the, uh, greater Patagonian conure, their weight range is about like 320 to 390 grams. So just a little bit of variability in, in the size of them. Um, and with that also a little bit, bit of variability in the size, um, there's a little bit of differences in the feather coloration. Um, the, again, particular subspecies that I was seeing in Chile, they have a little bit brighter yellow on their like underside and show you some pictures that show that. Um, and they also have a little bit more extensive of like a white marking forming this pectoral band over their chest. And again, I'll, I'll show that to you guys as well. But to me, it says like in the, in the uh, descriptions I could find, they call it a pectoral band, but I would say that little white line kind of runs more at the crop area. Um, but the other species, the lesser Patagonians, they don't have as much yellow on the bottom and they don't have this little white, 
whitish band by the crop area. So um, the, the differences in the subspecies, um, again, if you looked back at that map and you could kind of see how there's some on the Chile, um, Chilean country and there's some like over on the uh, more in Argentina, um, it's thought that they may have originated in Chile and then there was like some single migratory crossing over the Andes uh, where they then moved into Argentina and had more of an eruption in that portion of South America. Um, and if, if you haven't been to South America and seen the Andes, like you got to go at some point in your life because the Andes are amazing. Like the height of these mountains um, is just immense. Uh, it, it's almost like uh, mind blowing because, you know, here again, me in North America and the US, I'm, I'm around mountains and I think I, I know about mountains, but then I go other places and going to the, see the Andes is just, I mean, those mountains are so, so tall. And I, you know, I think about this uh, migrational crossing. It's no wonder it was believed to be a single migrational crossing because thinking about those birds flying over the the mountains to get to the you know opposite side there I, I don't know it's just it's it's amazing and maybe we don't have that quite right you know maybe with more time people will have other theories that pop up uh I don't know but pretty cool stuff um the other thing that's neat about the Patagonian conure is they're a little bit sexually dimorphic. So the males are actually a little bit bigger than the females, um, and they have a little bit more red um, and larger abdominal red patch um, on their like abdomen region. So sometimes those sexual dimorphisms are a little harder for us humans to tell, uh, but the birds could tell. And the other thing that's super cool about the Patagonian conure is they actually nest in limestone and sandstone cliff faces in large groups. Um, thus, the other name that a lot of people will call them is the burrowing conure. So like when I went down to Chile um, and I had told this when we were setting up this um, trip, um, I had spoken with a travel agency and they got us in contact with a um, bird a birding group to take us on this bird tour. And I had said I wanted to see the Patagonian conure. And someone was a little confused at first. And then I was like, oh, uh, the burrowing conure. You know, and then they were like, oh yeah, of course we could go see the burrowing conure because you know they call it the burrowing conure. They don't they don't call it as much the, the Patagonian conure. At least the, the individuals that I was speaking with were much more um saying calling them the burrowing conure. So you know there's just little bits of regional differences in the way that we refer to the species. Um, but the reason that the Varan Conyer, that name, you know, describes what it is that that they do, you know, they're 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 nesting and burrowing into these cliff faces, which is really cool and, and unique. Okay, so now we're gonna go on my journey of actually finding these birds. So uh, when you go on a birding tour, if you've ever been on a birding tour or you know, gone out birding with anybody, it's always uh, adventure because you never know what you're actually going to see, right? Like there is no way that you can tell a particular species of bird to be at this location at this time. So these people can look at you because why would that happen? You know? Um, so it's, it's always hit or miss. Like there's days where when you go out on birding, you're going to see tons of different species and there's days where you really may not see much. Um, and so it's, it's taking a little bit of a risk too, like going to another country to see these particular species of, am I actually going to get to see it like there's the possibility I could go there with the full intent of wanting to see this bird and didn't show up that day you know and I missed out um so but we go to places that are typically going to where they're typically going to be um and so our tour guide took us to this beautiful lake um and we were looking around at a couple of other birds and um before we actually saw them we heard them, which is a, a kind of fun thing. And if you think about it with a lot of parrots, like, I mean, you know, you walk in your house, do you always see your bird first or do you hear them first? A lot of times you hear them squawking first and then, you know, you turn a corner and hey, there's a bird. Um, so it's like that in the wild, you know, parrots are very vocal. They are, you know, in, in groups. So they're communicating with one another as they're flying around from one place to another, as they're foraging and doing their own behaviors. Um, and so, 
you know, you often hear them before you actually see them. So we were at this little lake area and we heard them coming in and I saw them off in the distance, but I couldn't get a photo because they were too far away, but I could see little black dots in the distance. And I knew that that was the conure that we were, that we were looking for, but they took off over, over this beautiful lake off to somewhere else. Um, I also wanted to show these pictures because again, for me, who is, you know, I'm biased because I live where I live um, and I'm not living somewhere where parrots are. And again, I often think about these very tropical environments that these birds live in. Um, this doesn't look very tropical to me, you know, where this where this bird is. It's kind of scrub land and, um, you know, some some deciduous trees and coniferous trees and stuff and and it doesn't look like this tropical rainforest environment which is just cool again to think about like the diversity of our species that live in on our planet um, and the different areas that they have uh, adapted to and, and, and live in. Um, just a couple of other pictures. Again, they were flying around. I could hear them, but I couldn't get a picture of them initially, which is very typical, I think, of when you're uh, going out trying to find species. You know, sometimes it's uh, a little, a little uh, initially uh, frustrating because you're like, oh, I just want to see this bird so bad and I can hear it. I want to take a picture of it, but I can't get to it because it's too far away. It's, it lands somewhere for a second and takes off. Um, but that's part of the adventure and the real fun of doing these sort of things. Um, but again, just trying to show you guys the scenery of where this bird is living. Um, this is, the Andes are, the Andes Mountains are actually on the opposite side of the road that where I was taking this picture. So these are just short little mountains um, all close to the coastal edge. Um, but I mean, look how green and, and beautiful it is. But again, it's not like, it, it, like a tropical environment. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a bit cold actually, uh, when we, when we were there, but this was like their springtime. Cause remember that, um, you know, uh, it's opposite based on the hemispheres, right? So like right now, uh, it is February in, and in North America, that means it's winter time. So in South America, it's summertime. Um, so we weren't able to get pictures of the birds there, but again, uh, we heard them, we could see little black dots flying off, uh, in the distance. We knew they were around. And so our guide had said to us, Hey, let's go a little to a little different area where maybe we're going to be able to see these guys. I know an area where they like to nest and where they like to have their areas where they burrow. And so this is actually a picture where, uh, showing an area where they do nest. So this isn't a super high cliff or anything like that, but this is a cliff face um next to a little you know river that's passing by um that this particular guide knew that these birds would like to to burrow along um and have their nesting now nobody was actually here because again we can't tell the birds to be there what, exactly when we want them to be there but it was still cool because we got to see what their environment is is like when they do want to nest you know so again it's just this really little rocky cliff face um where you kind of want expect a parrot to be hanging out you know but it's it's actually sort of safe because what predator is really going to be climbing down that you know sheer cliff face and again this wasn't very tall but in other areas where the cliff faces are much more tall um it's dangerous for some mammals that could be predators to be hanging out around there uh, and thus you know it's safer for the parrots to be having their babies in in these locations also since we're just right next to like a water you know area a water source that's you know beneficial for the birds too of course um so neat to to see an area where they do like to nest though they weren't at this location uh when we were there okay finally got a picture now they're just little black dots but this was the first picture that i was able to get of the birds um and you can see against this mountain face here you can see all those little guys so that was you know a group of five patagonian conures that were flying past um and they were doing exactly what they were supposed to do they're hanging out in groups because there's safety in numbers um they were squawking the entire time as they were going past so it wasn't um they were not stealthy by any means uh but they were you know communicating with one another so this 
was just a great example of showing how social these birds are, how they want to travel in groups and how they want to um, constantly be in like contact with one another. So, you know, sometimes in our homes, we humans sometimes can get annoyed by birds squawking and talking more than we find pleasant sometimes, um, but it's a totally natural and normal behavior. And so it's neat to see that in the wild because it's a reminder for us that, hey, if we're taking these birds into our homes and we are having them be a part of their lives, then we need to respect some of the things that they do naturally in the wild, which is a lot of talking to one another and socializing and, and you know, um, contact calling so that they can feel safe. Okay, so uh those conures took off so we had to get back in the car and we had at this point stopped probably like four different places trying to to find the birds and we were driving along and because the people who do these birding tours are really attuned to you know the littlest things that uh could potentially be a bird i didn't see it at first but the the tour guide that we were with uh we were driving along and he saw um a bird sitting on a wire and he stopped the car quickly and we saw that oh my gosh it's the patagonian conure so if you look at this picture over here here is just you know a uh, electrical pole um with a wire on it and we've got our little cute little patagonian conure so this was the first picture where i was actually able to tell a little bit more of, of what uh the bird was um uh, we're just oh you scared there sorry mose i don't know what happened but there was some bump and it terrified maureen for a moment so Anyways, um, back to our cute little Conure. Um, so he's just hanging out there and he was actually sort of the uh, bird who was keeping watch because then when we looked down, we didn't see these birds until we had stopped and got out of the car and was uh, you know viewing this guy. We heard him talking to his friends on the ground. And so you can see these little guys, they're actually foraging around in these grasses that are just right up against the, the side of the road there. Um, so again, another cool way to see these birds foraging and finding their food. Um, and, and what was that stuff? It was just little grasses and some little bushes and they were just finding, you know, little seed heads um, and, you know, other plant parts uh, on, on the ground there that they were picking through. I actually have a video of them foraging, so I'm gonna get that together. Let me stop sharing for just a second while I get that video up. Um, okay, and let me pause this. And go back to you guys, and I'm gonna share my screen again. All right, no worries. There we go. Great. So um, you can see him right here. That I know it's a little brown spot, but it'll make more sense in a moment. So you can see him just sort of forging around. And there's the one up on the wire there. There's traffic going by very fast. Um, so of course, they have to be cautious and careful. Um, but they were being pretty good about not getting onto the road at all. And you can just see them forging around on the ground there again as little little groups. So and then I have um one other one. This one. Dr. Lamb, would you? consider them like as gregarious as like I would imagine like wild like cockatoos in Australia like like um um like if you had if you're eating something would they try to come up and get it <laughs> like if it was a like a sandwich you know, or yeah I'm not sure I don't I don't know if they were that gregarious I mean they were not upset by us being across the road there um they certainly you know knew we were there they seem to have some level of comfort, but I don't think they were too 
interested in coming over to us you know like they weren't that interested they were like oh there's humans over there but like we're foraging we got stuff to do you know um and that one that's up on the wire i mean he really seemed to be the guy who was just checking everything out making sure everything was okay his buddies are down there he needs to let them eat and i don't i didn't see them switch off or anything like that but i wondered if that's what was you know going going to happen maybe um or you know had he already eaten he didn't care and he was full i'm not too sure all right i'm gonna stop showing again for just a moment while i get back up to the powerpoint here and back and wait so um we did get a couple of other little attempt to get some closer videos oh i think second sorry sorry I left the uh, video just on loop and I figured people probably don't want to hear them constantly talking, or maybe you guys do. You guys are the correct uh, audience who would care about birds continuing to talk, but I took it off. So, okay. Um, so, uh, we were taking these pictures through like little spotting scopes because we didn't want to go across the street, even though we were just, you know, right across, we didn't want to bother them. You know, one of the things about observing nature is trying to be as low intrusive as possible so that, you know, you can just watch and see what they're doing because that's part of what's so cool about it is getting to know them in a different way. And if I walk across the street and I disrupt them, one, they may just fly off and then I've lost my opportunity to observe those behaviors. Um, you know, or two, maybe I will make them become more engaged with me. And maybe that's not what I want so much because I want to see what they're doing. Like I came all the way, you know, from very far away uh, to watch what you guys are doing. And, and that's more interesting to me to see how you guys interact together and what it is you're eating and, you know, the vocalizations and all that sort of stuff that you're doing. How do you play together? All that fun stuff. So we, we, set up a, right across the street with a little spotting scope to observe them from afar. And so you can kind of see these two hanging out together, just looking around, enjoying enjoying the day. Um, again, it was cooler. So I would say the temperature was probably like in the high 50s that, that day when we were there. Um, so it was sunny. So I think they were also just enjoying the warmth from the sun. Um, and then a couple of other closer ups through that spotting scope. So here's our, our cute little guy, you know, uh, looking looking at us. He jumped off the the um, pole and onto the wire, you know, and then he's like crossing over on onto the wire. Um, and, you know, uh, there were two of them at, you know, one point where one was actually like on the pole and one was um, just, you know, talking to his friend. Um, but this is actually a good picture to show you guys that difference of this particular subspecies. So again, this is the greater Patagonian conure and the major differences between the greater Patagonian and the lesser Patagonian, which again, I believe that we're calling the lesser Patagonian those three different subspecies. It's from what I could tell, um, but I might be a little bit incorrect about that, but um, it's just the one subspecies, the C. Patagonis phylloxami, that is the greater Patagonian conure. But the difference is you can see it right here. See this like white band that's around the I, it's, it says it's pectoral band, but to me, it's kind of over the crop area. Um, that whitish band is one of the differences between the greater and the lesser. And then also a much, much more yellow, um, uh, much brighter yellow on the like underbelly here. And so like, if anybody has a Patagonian conure at home that's watching this, um, you know, look at your bird and, and see, does your bird have this particular differences does it have that you know wider band does it have that brighter yellow belly if it does then your bird is from the um you know chilean subspecies versus if your bird doesn't have those particular changes okay then your bird is um more like on the argentini argentina side um and the lesser uh patagonian conure probably a little little bit smaller than this particular subspecies that we were that we were looking at um, okay, so again, just another video or another picture there, just kind of showing them from the side. Um, and then again, I just wanted to show more pictures of what the environment looked like. 
Um, so these rocky, you know, mountain slopes and everything, and a lot of these coniferous trees, there's snow in the background, um, it's a little cooler, um, and, you know, water real close by. Okay, um, so now while I was there, that was the, that was just the only time we saw them, it was just on that one part, portion of the tour, but it was great, and I was like, all right, I got to see what I wanted to see. Now, I did get to see lots of other bird species, too, so um, it wasn't just the Patagonian conure that I got to observe, but that was the one that I really wanted to go down there and see, so it was really uh, exciting for me, and I felt like I fulfilled, uh, you know, I, I checked a uh, box off of my list of things that I want to do in life. <laughs> um, so, but to give you guys a little bit more information about the Patagonian conure, you know, we, we don't see them um, as much in captivity as I think, you know, earlier years, you know, 40 years ago, uh, you know, 50 years ago in captivity, uh, because things have changed a, a little bit. And so now I probably see maybe a Patagonian, maybe in my, my practice, um, couple times a year, three, four times a year, maybe. It's, it's not that much that I actually see this particular species. Um, and the reason for that is um, because uh, there is a herpes virus, the tacit herpes virus one. It is the causative agent of Pacheco's disease. And um, this particular virus was a big problem back when birds were still being imported into the U.S. Since importations of birds stopped in the U.S., um, we don't have this particular disease as much of a problem. Um, but what this disease did is it would cause GI problems, respiratory problems, and neurologic problems. And so you could have birds that had, you know, were inappetent because of GI problems. They were throwing up. They had diarrhea, um, respiratory problems. They may just have respiratory distress. They're breathing heavy, tail bobbing, nasal discharge, ocular discharge, and then neurologic problems, seizure activity, weakness, um, and sudden death. Uh, if they got this particular virus, the cetacid herpes virus one, or if you know if any bird gets this well, any parrot gets this particular virus. They can show these signs and they can they can die. I mean, the mortality is can be greater than 80%. So it's a, a pretty nasty virus. But if they survive it, then they can go on to develop papillomas, which are these like little growths, um, like little lumpy circular growths that almost look like little warts. Um, that can happen in the oral cavity, but more commonly like in the cloaca. Um, and because there's not just one cytosine, uh, cetacid herpes virus one, there's uh, several different genotypes of it. Um, there's certain genotypes that are more likely to cause mucosal papillomas. And then there's other genotypes that if they get that particular genotype and they survive from it, they may not go on to develop mucosal papillomas, but they may actually go on to develop certain cancers. Uh, biliary and pancreatic duct carcinomas are something that were seen as um, like problems later on down the road when birds would have this particular virus and survive from it. Again, about 80% of birds when, when contracting this vi virus could die if they were in the correct environment. And by correct environment, I mean like a environment where uh, it was not as healthy as we'd like it to be. Um, overcrowding, you know, too many individuals, um, in inappropriate, diet, inappropriate, um, you know, heat, you know, it's too hot or it's too cold, um, poor air circulation. So, you know, and import stations, when birds used to have to be imported into the U.S., it, they'd have to sit in a, like, quarantine station, which, you know, isn't necessarily the best environment to be hanging out in for a period of time. And if you've got a bird in there that's sick, it could potentially spread it to others. It's, that's sort of what we mean by correct environment. So correct environment is actually more synonymous with like incorrect bad environment uh in it, you know not um not a healthy environment so but why why how did this affect the patagonians why was this particular virus linked to the patagonians and why we don't see it so much in captivity um it's because in one particular outbreak of this particular virus 
where there were over 7,000 birds in quarantine and there were a variety of different species, cockatoos, um, canary wing parakeets, Quakers, Amazons, hyacinths, green wing cause, uh, Patagonians, Nanday Conyers. In this quarantine station where this outbreak hit, all these different species of birds, of parrots were dying from the virus, but no Patagonians and no Nanday Conyers died during the outbreak. So this then made people go, well, why didn't they die? Are they the carriers of this virus? Did they bring this virus in to this situation? Um, and because of that, it started to make people be like, well, if these guys are surviving the virus and we're worried that they're carriers, we don't really want them. So they kind of became considered dirty birds um, that they may be they may be carrying this and they could potentially give it to other birds. And that's why they became um, not so popular in the pet trade anymore. Um, however, you know, any bird that survives the virus could become latently infected. So what we don't know about the Patagonian conure and what was never determined was, were they resistant to the infection? Was it not that they were carriers? Was it just that they've got some, you know, slight genetic improvement over other individuals that allowed them to survive it and not have problems from it? So maybe they didn't bring it in, but maybe they're just healthier in some slight way that allowed them to survive and they were wrongly accused. Um, or or were they the ones who brought it in? Do they do they have some better ability to deal with the virus and then they can carry it and they can shed it and give it to others and, and truly be a problem? We don't know, that was never determined. So um, it, to this day, it has still been that, well, we, we, you know, maybe we shouldn't have the, the Patagonians mixed with other blocks, you know, and, and people will have them mixed with other birds. It's just um, that outbreak situation really painted them in a bad light because they survived, um, which is sad, um, but you know, the truth. So, so we don't know, um, but there you go. That's the history of why the Patagonians aren't been uh, as popular in, in captivity. Okay, bonus, uh, I'm gonna show you guys one more bird species that I saw while I was out there as well. You heard about the Patagonian. Uh, that was what I went down there to see. But I did go see other birds and other species while I was there, which was really cool. But there was one particular species that I was not expecting to see while I was down there. Um, and when I encountered it, I was uh, just super excited that I got to see this, this other species of parrot. And this is the Austral parakeet, also known as the Austral conure. Uh, but again, down there, um, in South America, um, people were calling it the Austral parakeet, um, but here we may call it the Austral conyer. So you, you could hear it by either name, it's the same bird. Um, now this bird is really cool because it was even further south than the Patagonian conyer. So again, I have my, my map here of Chile, and again, Maui where I was was somewhere like maybe about there-ish, I think, um, and we were all the way down here at uh, Torres del Pine National Park, which is, you know, most people don't go, I think, there for birding. It's more like a uh, real cool, outdoorsy, like amazing part of the world to, to see lots of great hiking and, and outdoor activities. Um, but of course, because I, I love birds so much, um, I was like, oh, I want to see the birds while I'm here. Um, so this particular species uh, is down there and it is cold down there. Um, and again, we were there during the springtime um, and I think the highs for the day were like low 50s. Uh, and you know, me saying cold, keep in mind, I, I live in Arizona, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm used to like warm temperatures. Um, <laughs> so to me, 50s is cold, um, whereas other people may not think of it as cold. But um, the reason I bring it up in this context is the temperature is because, you know, one of the questions I get asked a lot is what is the temperature that is like too cold for my bird? When do I need to bring my bird inside or, you know, not go outside? When do I need to provide supplemental heat? That sort of thing. And I'll often give a general um, answer to that. Of, well, we definitely know they need like a supplemental heat when it's less than 55, 
but you know it's really variable for one species to another and also your birds that are been living in a captive environment are going to be different than birds living out in the wild but it is really neat to see that they actually can uh live in much cooler temperatures and like hang out in the snow and the rain and like really windy environments and they're just like hey this is life it's cool everything's fine um so they're much more adaptive than we often give them the ability to be you know um but back to the how are these guys related to other species i had to bring my phylogenetic tree back up this is that patagonian conure and again we saw how the patagonian conure is branched off from all these different species of you know like our little macaws and everything but if we look at this particular species um this is the uh, Aniconathus genus that the austral parakeet belongs to. And you can see with how our um, phylogenetic tree is, it's actually very closely related to the Patagonian conure and where they kind of branched off. Okay, now these guys were much harder for me to take a photo of. So that initial photo I showed you was a uh, internet search photo uh, with my citation at the bottom there. These are my photos. This is where I found them. I was not expecting to find them. We were on this like flora and fauna tour. So we're seeing like various different species and we stopped somewhere for lunch. Um, and you can see it's overcast. It was like raining that day. Um, and we stopped at these little places to, to have lunch um, with this tour group that we were on. And while the tour group people were like setting up the lunch for us, they were like, go just, you know, look around, do what you want, come back in like five minutes and we'll have lunch ready for you. And I heard a parrot squawking because, you know, the people who are watching this have parrots. We know what parrots sound like in our homes. You can tell what a parrot is compared to, you know, a passerine squawk, you know, talking out there. And so I, I heard a parrot squawk and I was like, there's a parrot out there. I need to go find it. What is it? Um, so I searched around and looked up in the trees and here's this tiny little thing. And then you see these little black dots flying away. Like there's the little dot and there's the tiny little wings that they, that, that was them. They, they took off. Um, they were flying around. They were looping, looping around in the sky. Um, I could not get a super close video of them. And this is me like zooming in on my camera. Um, and I didn't come with a great camera. I am, uh, I love watching birds. I enjoy going out and seeing them, but I'm I'm not at the level of some birders who have really great like camera equipment. I'm I'm not there. Um, so this is my cell phone. Um, but here's here's this cute little austral parakeet hanging out at the top of this tree. Oh, this one was like a little deeper in the tree. I couldn't get great photoing because the lighting just wasn't right for it for you to see their colors and everything. Uh, oh, and then I have a video of them. Let me stop sharing for a second. Let me go pull that up. Um, and oops, disappeared on me. Come back. Okay. So this one's even a little um, less oh, this, Are the um, I had a quite, are they, uh, the the um, what, uh, I'm going to say the name the Austro. The, the those Austral. parrots are, are uh -huh. they close in size to the Patagonian? Are they no? They're smaller. They're like lot smaller, like, like green sheet conure size. Oh wow, they look they look robust. <laughs> yeah, they're like they're tiny. Okay, um, let me go back to sharing my screen for you guys because I got it up now. Okay. So it's a very short video. And before I start it, I want you to pay attention. You see those little black dots at the top of this tip of this tree. Yes. That's them. So there you go. <laughs> so it's a very short video because you know it's far away and, and they were just taking off. But but notes the environment. Like it is overcast. It is raining in this video. You can see like the rain kind of coming down and look at how windy it is. And they're just hanging out up there. You know, again, it goes, it just was amazing to me because I think so much about protecting our birds and keeping them like safe and, and not exposed to the elements. But look at them, they're out there having a great time being exposed to the, the elements. You know, as you were talking about the Amazons uh, in California, the wild Amazons that are out there and them just having fun in the rain, you know, um, sometimes I think man, we protect them a little too much sometimes. And, you know, maybe we do need to let them have a little bit more fun out there, out, you know, being exposed to the elements in some way, of course, safe. But, you yeah. know, um, just uh, helicopter parents. <laughs> yeah. Are. Okay. 
And uh, let me go back to this. All right. So the other thing that I did with these guys, because I wanted to see like what it was they're eating, because I, I love nutrition. I think it's really interesting. And so I actually took a couple of pictures of the things that we were watching them them eat. And so they actually they do eat lichen, which is really cool. Like how who feeds their parrot lichen? Like pretty sure nobody. Um, but they eat that, you know. Um, and these little berries. I'm not really quite sure what particular species this of of bush this was. Um, and these little flowers. They were eating these little flowers. Um, and this is just another picture of the environment where there's in Torres del Paine. Again, it is cold. Um, and look at that mountain off in the distance. You can't even see the mountains really well because it was just so cloudy and everything. But um, and anybody who's been down there knows that it's a, a very beautiful um, and and uh, amazing environment, but it's cold. Uh, and so just so neat to see a little a little green cheek conure sized parrot hanging out down there having fun. Wow. That's um, so yeah, so that's that was my adventure. These are just a couple of other species that I got to see. Um, this is the upland goose. They're they're sexually dimorphic. So the brown one is the female, the white one's the male. Oh, and then that little guy right behind him, which is kind of hard to see, that is the Austral Robin, I think. It's like our American Robin that we have here. I mean, they look very similar. Austral Thrush, Austral Thrush, that's what it was. Austral Thrush, it's like the American Robin. Um, this is a Southern Caracara. Uh, in Arizona, we have the Crested Caracara. Uh, these guys were really cool too. Um, they're in like the Falcon family. So they're they're neat because they're these raptors, but they're very, they're very, social and and there's many parrot like things about them which is cool um this is the magellanic woodpecker he was huge i mean this guy was you can't tell with the picture but he was he was a good size woodpecker um and then this is their spotting scope but that is a juvenile um uh, andean condor so so there you go. That was wow. my uh, trip. Uh, I know we don't have much time for questions. I'm not sure that there was going to be too many questions with this particular one, but if anybody had any questions in the last few minutes, I'm happy to answer. All right. Well, that was amazing. Is there is there something on the, that you wish you brought with you on your trip? Like, you're, oh, if I only had my, like, I mean, you bring a field guide with you or do you know, do you know these birds ahead of time? Like what to look um, for? You know, so silly me, I forgot to bring binoculars, um, but I bought some while I was out there. Like, you know, when you go on vacations, at least for me, there's always something I forget. And I knew I was doing these bird tours. I mean, like this was really important to me and I forgot to bring my binoculars. So I had to buy more when I was down there, but it's okay. Um, and then I, this particular trip, um, I did not buy a field guide and it would have been nice to to buy a field guide. I, I've done that before with a couple of other places I've gone to and it's, it is nice to have those field guides. So nice. Yeah. And also I think practicing with binoculars because I'm, I'm yeah. a terrible birder. Like I, they're gone by the time I can focus in a tree. So maybe practice ahead of time in your neighborhood. It's, your neighborhood. It's, it's totally true. My husband, like he, he's, he, he loves animals, but he's, you know, not as, he's not as into animals as I am. So like he, he does these tours with me, but like when I, I have, I'm better with finding stuff with the binoculars and I have to tell him exactly where to like go to like, so that he can see it because he just gets lost when he's behind binoculars. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. We do have a question for you. Uh, is there any information regarding the impact uh, that the recent fires in Chile had on the Patagonian conure population? So the fires uh, affect that at all? You know, I don't know. I I don't know the answer to that question. I wish I did, but I really am not too sure. I I don't think they had much of an effect, but I, I I'm I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question. I'm sorry. Okay. And then a uh, question about the um. Let's see. Was the um was the ma megal you know woodpecker? Thank you. Uh, bigger than uh than a a, a pileated a pileated pileated I'm killing words. So sorry. yes, I mean this guy looked like I was surprised how large he was. You know, and he has this giant like red head. I mean, how could you miss that red? And in, in, you know, I mean, you can see how his body blends into the tree, but that red is such like that red head is such a huge signal of here I am. But yeah, they they did seem bigger. Wow, that's an amazing bird. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that bill. I could totally hammer things in uh, yeah. and and just real quick so um so you you were you, you kind of had in a mention there where you you had a photo through your your uh, binocular through your right through the lens of your you use your yeah. camera and just to get a closer shot yeah yeah like this one down here of the andean uh condor right yeah. here 
that yeah. is also through a spotting scope. And so if you if you put if you take your cell phone and you line it up just right, oh, that's perfect. Scope, you can you can get a photo. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I think I, I have found spotting scopes to be a little easier for me because I'm challenged with binoculars. <laughs> like I I just I'll have to only have to focus with one eye. So I, I totally yeah. that's that's my good jam. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, wow. So um, yeah, that is a good uh, a good bucket list trip that you went on. So I can totally see. That's amazing. Yeah, I love it. I hope. Uh, I hope. Uh, I hope everyone else, uh, just a uh, man seeing those in the just hearing about their their life in the wild is is really uh, it's yeah. it's fascinating. It is very. I I find it very fascinating, and I think I encourage anybody to go and travel and see these birds because it gives you a, a whole new appreciation for them. You know, I I feel like I'm a changed person when I get to see birds in the wild, and and it, I just. I feel more connected to them too, you know? I love that you kind of like looking to see what they're foraging on and, and getting a really good feel for the environment. That's, that's, that's kind of neat. You can even do that with the birds in your own neighborhood. It's just like, what are they doing? Like, they're not just sitting in trees and flying around They're you know, exactly. Doing, so. They've got their own little lives, you know, and things that are going on. So it's really fun to sit back and watch them and watch their little soap operas. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Okay. I got some announcements to make. Um, we got, so, okay. Uh, first of all, today's giveaway winner, we have a giveaway winner and that is going to be, uh, going out. This is going to be some, um, it's the 40th anniversary of advocate. So guess what? We're going to be sending you some advocates. That's going to Jan, uh, Trudell, um, as well as another, um, uh, product of your bird's choice from the fever. And, um, let's see. Okay. So next time we're on with you next month, we have a special, um, it's going to be someone's special birthday. Uh, so a uh, ten, 10 year anniversary or uh, 10 year birthday of um, a special feathered friend that people might know from being, uh, if you've been on our webinars before. Uh, so we're going to actually have some, some special giveaway. I mean, it's, you've got to join this because it's going to be a little um, party we're having and, uh, and we're going to have some party favors to give away, so to speak. I'll put that in quotes. Um, but we have some, we actually have some uh, cool things that we're going to be doing some extra prizes and some special offers. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's going to be a Royals birthday. Don't yell him. We're going to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we're surprised. That's why he's not here today because we didn't want him to know that we have a surprise set up. Exactly. Well, and she won't tell him. Is Marine, is she invited to the party? <laughs> Maybe we'll see. Okay. All right. So everyone, you have to join us. Um, and that's going to be in March. Uh, what, what days <laughs> is he's a March, a March birthday. Um, and then um, also, uh, let's see what else we have. Um, oh, so any, just going to rewind a little bit. Anyone who was on with us last Friday, um, if they're interested in having, um, in going to the, the, um, the conference, the, um, that they're, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm having a, I'm having a brain blank here, but um, the Phoenix Landing uh, Conference with um, uh, Dr. Arose as well. Uh, yeah. You you can get a the discount code. You just got to uh, contact um it's they're, they're still going to uh, honor the uh, early bird discount code. That's in April, beginning of April. So um, that is going to be contact at phoenixlanding.org. So um, so if you didn't have a chance to register and you, you, you feel like going, it's uh, North Carolina next uh, in April. So it's coming up fast. Come be here before you know it. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Oh my gosh, we got so many. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just another, we have the, uh, it's the 40th anniversary of Abigakes, um, and it's the 50th anniversary of Lithium Nutriberries. We just got so many anniversaries that uh, the Fieber does, but um, uh, they, they're, the, the reason I was throwing this shirt, and I'm going to show it again on the back here, hopefully you can see it, um, it's got all the birds on it, hopefully you can see Cute. it. Cute, how um, fun. It's part of the Valentine's bundle that's on uh, lefebvre.com um, on their shops. Uh, so it, there's a little, a cute little bundle of, of uh, t-shirts and some, and some Lefebvre foods. So uh, and you know, Valentine's is next week. So I think, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fast approaching too. So, all right. <laughs> um, uh, next Friday, we're going to be on with, uh, Pamela Clark and she's going to give us, uh, the lowdown on how to find a reputable, a reputable bird breeder. So I hope you come back for that. Um, Dr. Lamb, thank you so much, uh, for the pa Patagonian Conyers, man. I, oh, just to see those guys in person is so amazing. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I hope you have, uh, many, I can't wait to see what my next species pops up for this series. So there we go. All right. All right. On that all right. note, all the best, um, all the best to you and your flock. Everyone be safe. And until next time. Bye. Bye.